Hello, I'm Barbara Gahn-Mueller, and I am delighted that you're giving us 20 minutes of your precious life, 20 minutes to make peace possible, 20 minutes to hear Grace Fonzell, who is able to tell you how her life is devoted to peace. You know, I'm talking to Grace today because we, our program, The Power of Peace, peacepodcast.org, is uh, for peace, healthy living, and last but not least, happiness. Some people say to me, how do I know if my life is working? I say, are you happy? Are you doing work that is meaningful? And then I read Grace Fonzell's website and she wrote this, you hold the key to a better future. It's all about choice, decisions and actions. And when I looked at that, I thought, Maybe that's why I have on the front of my Peace Podcast magazine, you are the peace other people need. And as I look at Grace, I realize she has, if she realizes herself, all the people she has touched, she was at the Houston Convention. She just did a peace conference in her own community in Southern Africa. She is a speaker, author, mentor, and a financial life strategist by profession. And then she has children. And then she is a newly elected board member of the Rotary Action Group for Peace. And she was just awarded the meritorious, and I'm saying this because there's only one or two ever receiving the Rotary Foundation meritorious service. And well, how would tell me what award you just got, Grace. It's a citation for merit, meritorious service from the Rotary Foundation. Meritorious service. Now, you know I'm a Rotarian, Rotarian. Grace is a Rotarian. We're both in the Rotary Action Group for Peace. Think about what that means to be in the Rotary Action Group for Peace. She's an avid peace builder. She formed the she was first peace builder club in Southern Africa in 2020 appointed to the Peace Builders Club in District 9400. In 2021, she was instrumental in forming the African Peace Hour once a month. And, you know, you think about how can I incorporate peace in my life? Well, that's what you're going to find out today, because Grace is what I consider somebody who not only is a mother, not only is a businesswoman, not only is a Rotarian, but she's a mentor. When I was doing a workshop in Santa Barbara, we realized that when you become a global citizen, you learn from your mentors. And so tonight you're going to listen. It's afternoon, this night, or whatever time it is for you. We're going to ask this question. First, I'm just going to say you are amazing, Grace. And I welcome you with all my heart to this Peace Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, um, you might think I'm amazing, but what I do is is just a way of life. being being a Rotarian and, and doing what I do is just, it just comes naturally and it's a way of life. So I, I'm often astounded when people say I'm amazing because I'm actually just like you and just like anyone <laughs> in the community. <laughs> well, you know, um, I feel the same way about you. I feel the same way about myself. I think I make the most of every moment if I can. I also oh. think time to relax and enjoy peace just myself I do my gratitude journal I meditate I walk in the garden right before our interview today with you and my peace podcast I was out in the garden looking at my zucchinis and watching the birds and then watching the bees pollinate these blossoms that were as big as a, a grapefruit and I'm thinking thank you bees Thank you, God, for giving us this nature. So I want to say after my congratulations to being on the board for the Road Reaction Group for Peace, what drew you to peace, Grace? I think um, it started when I I was married. I, I'm, I'm, I was widowed at the age of 45. But um, before that, I was married to a man um, for 13 years and um for the first year of our life, we had an amazing marriage. And then he got very ill and I nursed him for 12 years. And eventually he passed away um, after 13 years. And our lives changed dramatically when illness set on, on us. You know, we, we learned to appreciate the smaller things in life, the birds, the bees, the gardens, 
um, the ability to wake up every morning, to be um, healthy, to, to have food on the table. So all those things that people take for granted became very real in, in those times. And I think that's what made, made peace become very part of my life because you, you've got to be at peace. You cannot be stressed about where's your next meal coming from, whereas um, you, you start appreciating the small things in life. And I think that's where it all started. I then joined Rotary during that period, and Rotary became very, very much a big part of my life. It was my social life. It was my, it was a way for, it was my coping mechanism, because instead of focusing on all the challenges in my own life, I was able to focus on challenges of other people's lives. And I think it was just a natural progression that um, we are we have peace in our DNA, whether we like it or not. And when we're exposed to challenges and when we're exposed to the kind of circumstances that I was exposed to, that peace, um, that feeling of peace or that yearning for peace just takes over and you just uh, you go with the flow. And that's exactly what happened to me. So to, to me, peace really does start at home. Because you, you do have to be peaceful within your own environment. You have to be accepting, accepting of what's going on in your life. And I think that's where it all started for me. You know, I totally agree with you. It, have to, it has to start at home. And during that period when you were nursing your husband, I can imagine how important your peace was to him at the same time as you were doing the necessities we all have necessities you can't get away from them but you know your life as I as I look at your website and I look at you and I see a beautiful woman who feels accomplished you know well did this all happen because you had a vision because you had a dream as Teilhard de Chardin said we go confidently it go confidently in the direction of your dreams and my husband said First you dream, see it in your mind, and then it happens. Is that what happened for you? How did you visualize your future or did it just happen? I think a lot of it just happened, but I think a lot of it was, was um, strategic and, and purposeful. So I grew up in poverty. Well, not extreme poverty, but um, we, we didn't have the best of everything. So come from a very, very um, menial family and had to fight for everything I had, had to work for everything I had. And especially in a, in a country where, and I think it's not just in our country, but many parts of the country where women are undervalued and women don't get the same opportunities as men, you really had to work so much harder. And I think my passion came from where I wanted to ev to let every person on earth, doesn't matter whether you're female, male, black, white, doesn't matter. I wanted to develop that person to their full potential. And I think that's where my journey on peace became. So my passion is helping people achieve the best person that they can be. Um, and peace Peace is very much part of that. And peace touches on every aspect of your life. So for many people, peace is not tangible. But for me, peace is very tangible. Because when you are able to pursue the career you want to achieve, um, pursue, regardless of race, regardless of gender, that brings peace. When you um, help somebody elevate themselves out of poverty, that brings peace. So it's my, my, my vision and my mission is to help every single person achieve the best person or the best version of themselves that they can possibly achieve. You know, it sure sounds like you had a, oh, I'm going to go back so I can see us together. It sure sounds like you had a vision that you would help people achieve their potential. Then doesn't that kind of match what um, people have said in the past, the prophets have said, <clears throat> when you have a vision and you see it, then the universe supports you, puts you in, in, in a way you said it was like the coincidences started happening to make this possible for you. Is that kind of the, what you noticed? Definitely. I'm, I just talk about my vocation in that sense. You know, when I was never in, in the financial, I've always been in financial service uh, planning or, or financial services. I was a, 
um, the, the, the chief um, or the main financial managing partner of a um, blue chip company, but that was financial. I then got the opportunity to go into financial services and the person that introduced me recognized something in me and said, you would make such a, an amazing financial advisor. Would you not um, want to be that? And I said, well, you know, let's give it a shot. I've got nothing to lose. And that was at the time where my husband had just um, got very ill. I had lost my employment. There was no money coming into the household. Um, so it was really, really dire. And I took the opportunity and I found that it spoke to my passion about helping people become the best versions of themselves. Because I can take somebody where they want to be in life and where they're trying to get to. I develop that plan and I help them achieve that. So my vocation speaks to my passion as well. And that happened by chance. It wasn't by design. I wanted to become a mechanical engineer. There was nothing financial about that. Um, and yet today I am a financial life strategist and I help people achieve the impossible. And I do that with everything in my rotary life as well. Isn't that beautiful? It's um, your passion, your vision. They kind of coincide and all of a sudden you're on this path of doing the best you can because you're doing what you love. You, as you said, peace is in your DNA. But I also think if we love peace, we don't forget about it. But it sounds like what you did was literally, thank you for doing it. Think of all the people you, em you empowered to be who they could be. It's sometimes very humbling. And sometimes you don't give yourself the credit for that. You know? and, and one of the things in life is that you need to celebrate your successes. But most philanthropists don't do that. You know, they, you, you, you're under the radar. You don't want the attention on you. You just want to um, empower people and help people, but you don't want the credits. Um, but that's also on the, on the reverse side. When you don't get the credit, you think, well, why am I doing this? So it's, it's a very difficult situation to be in. So you don't want to become um, blasé about it and, and, and all self-important to say, look what I've done. Um, because that's not what it's about. It's about empowering people. And I think the greatest reward that I can ever achieve is seeing the difference I make in people's lives. So beautiful. Seeing the difference I make in people's lives. Um, you said something about somebody said you'd make a great financial planner. And was that what he said? Yes. yes. And then you took the risk. This is an important concept. I use my, when I ran for political office in Santa Barbara, I did that because I wanted to empower women to run for office. All we had were all these men in every political position there is possible. And I live in Santa Barbara, a small town. And so I wanted to empower women. And so whenever I gave up teaching, the superintendent of schools position was an elected position. So I ran for superintendent of schools because I wanted women to see women could be the leaders of our town. Now we probably have 70% women in all the leadership. And I give myself a little bit of credit, but I also realized the power of the presence, just to be present and say, you can do this. And then I started doing workshops for women, telling them, sometimes you have, as you did, Grace, you have to take a risk. But then when you take that risk, you can give your full support to what it is that you risk to take, right? Exactly, exactly. It was a huge risk because at that time when I took that risk, my husband was um, bedridden. I had three children at school and I had absolutely zero income. <laughs> and uh, I hate was to laugh because it's so sad. <laughs> it was a huge risk. <laughs> and, but it paid off. It paid you off know. because the motive was correct. It's, I could just talk to you. In fact, let's start doing a workshop on risk, risk taking, and the rewards of risking. Once you know it's in your power to do something about it, and you know it's what you need to do, all the universe supports you. Anyway, um, well, now you know you've lived a busy life. You continue to do so. You Before the conference started today, I had you talking about how you just had to kind of be the person that everybody needed at your latest peace conference. But how do you incorporate peace in your daily life? And 
how can you help Rotarians who have peace in their blood, more or less, or they wouldn't be a Rotarian, to do more about peace, to believe that peace is possible, as your beautiful backdrop says? What do you do to encourage Rotarians and others to believe that peace is possible? So, so I need to just at the outset tell you that I'm human. Okay, so my family doesn't um, necessarily always experience my peacekeeping abilities because, uh-huh. you know, you normally take out your frustration and your stress on the, those dearest and closest to you. But um, you, you, uh, even that is a lesson because, you know, they'll tell you, um, you're trying to do this or you're trying to do that, but we're taking the brunt of your frustration and it makes you more mindful. And I think the one thing that I learned um, from, and and it's not something that just came to me, I've learned it from mentors through Rotary, through through the RAG, through through peace, through all, all through my life, is that one of the things that you need to do is actively listen. Because people don't um, really tell you what they are thinking or saying. They are That saying, read between the lines, is so powerful and it is so real. So when you hear somebody say something, don't respond immediately. Try and actively listen to what is the hidden message that they're trying to get through to you. Um, Scott, Dr. Scott Martin from Mediators Beyond Borders um, impacted me at the Houston Convention by saying, um, when somebody insults you, It is both a confession and a request for help. So it's a confession about how you're feeling about yourself, but it's also also saying, please help me, I'm drowning, I'm not coping. And I think if you start actively listening to people, you are then able to respond in a way that is not going to lead to more confrontation, but it's going to lead to um, sitting around the table and discussing your feelings. Conflict is so, so necessary in peace building because it's only through conflict that you understand the other side, that you understand the other party. And if you can do that without any bias or without any preconceived response, because many times we listen to people to respond. We are formulating our response in our mind while we're listening to people instead of blocking everything out and saying, I'm actually going to listen to you and try and find that hidden message before I respond to you. So although I'm not perfect, I try to apply that in everything. Mostly I'm successful and sometimes I'm not, but it is a journey. It's a learning experience. You cannot ever be 100% peaceful because we are human. I love what you said. And I interviewed over 300 peacemakers and every one of them said, peace is a journey, not a destination. And you just told us that peace is listening. Peace is trying to understand. Peace is that journey. And don't you learn so much more when you listen rather than respond? Exactly. Exactly. We're dealing with some conflicts in our club at the moment, and we've got two sides of of the coin. You know, one that is like saying you are totally disrespectful to Rotary and whatever, and the other one saying you don't understand my culture. Um, And both of them have validity. And trying to get them to sit around a table to actually discuss this as adults um, without emotion is, is I think is the probably the biggest challenge because you're getting where it goes. (laughs) You think about what you're going to bring to the world. Once you do this, this is every, I always say in every problem, there is a solution and something that we can share after. Um, I I have to tell you, I was just reading my own book. I wrote this book called Revolutionary Conversations, the tools you need for the success you want. Actually, it's the tools you need to bring peace to a conversation. And what do you think the first step is in our five-step process? Just what you're talking about. Stop. Don't think about what you're going to say. Stop the conversation for clarity. 
And then H, it's share, it's a share model. And the H is to help. Help me understand what you're saying. Instead of planning that response, help me understand what you're saying. And then ask a question, risk, and explore. But you ha- you can't go forward if everybody's on the different sides. You might as well forget it. You might as well just sit and hold your hands, hold your hands, and listen. Exactly. And I think it's about being curious. Um, you know, curious. if somebody says something to you, let your curiosity take control. Ask why. Why do you feel that way? Why Why do you respond that way? Why do you think this happened? Those questions are very, very important in peace building because it helps not making you form assumptions. So if you approach a conversation with a curious mind and an open mind, not with preconceived ideas, and I think that's the biggest challenge is many of us come into a situation and we have formulated our own ideas um, and solutions already to the problems before we've even heard anybody speak. So it's, it's having that curious mind and asking those questions because it's only by doing that that you can actually get to the bottom of what the real problems are. And, and that's not an easy job. It's, it's not easy. And it's not easy trying to convert an A-type personality to actually do that kind of thing. You know, so, so it's, a, it's, 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 it's huge. <laughs> There's an advantage um, to not speaking the same language um, too, also in listening. In the United Nations, I've had many opportunities to sit in the General Assembly. And because the translation is after the speaker speaks, it allows some time, it allows a pause. And that pause allows people to think, well, what does that say to me? What is that speaker saying that I need to know? And so that's why I wrote this prop revolutionary, revolutionary, because I said, if you do these five steps, these simple five steps, you can have a conversation that you can both be happy about. And you can maybe even have some peace after, maybe you can understand each other. So, Grace, your wisdom is profound. It's exactly what we need right now. We need to understand that peace is possible, and it begins with me. And so I wanted to ask you one last question, and that is, what do you want the world to know right now? If you were to say, I'm Grace, and I want the world to know, what would you like them to know? The world, our peaceful, our nature, etc. I think, I think it's, it's a very difficult question to answer that, and it's a very good question. And yes, peace is possible. But I think every country and every continent has its own challenges. And if I have to just apply the Maslow hierarchy of needs to this concept, it doesn't help you try and go in the top of, this, the, of that pyramid. So, for example, I'm in Africa. Africa has got a very big reputation for corruption. So for me to try and solve um, governmental issues at the higher level would be a total waste of time. I need to go in and solve the corruption issues. And what I want to do in Africa is to put the rotary four-way test in the face of every government official. I want it on posters, I want it on rulers, I want it as screensavers, mouse pads, whatever you want, because the more they see that four-way test, it becomes their moral compass. Once we've rooted out corruption, we can then move to the next level. But until we have fulfilled the bottom of the hierarchy of needs, we are not going to be successful if we're trying to go in at the top. And I think that's why we're not successful with peace, because we're trying to use a blanket approach to the world. And every part of the world has got different challenges. And we need to root out or address the challenges in that particular country or that particular continent in order of the hierarchy of needs of human nature. I mean, you, you first solve the basic needs, then you move on to the next ones. We need to solve the basic needs in Africa. And that's that's the, the message I would like to get across. I co- totally agree with you. And for those of you who are not Rotarians, I wanna to read to you the four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all? And that's the four-way test that we use in our Rotary Clubs. And it's allowing us to stop, as Grace talked about. It allows us to 
whatever we think, say, or do, asking ourselves, is this the benefit that I want to achieve? And be paying attention. Is it the truth? And, and is it beneficial to all? I always felt we should move them. The fourth one should be the first one. Is it beneficial to all? Because that's what we're asking. And you know, Grace, I love that. That's why I'm doing Peace Podcast. I want to start where people are. I don't necessarily have the patience to go through the government situation because they have power and they believe their power allows them to do certain things. No, the people elected you to do certain things. Listen to us, pay attention to us. If I had one wish, it would be that everybody in, in political offices would open their door and say, I'd like to hear from you. Pay attention. Grace, you are a joy to talk to. You are an accomplished woman. I have seen your results, the results of the work you've done in Southern Africa, and I thank you. Before I go, I know you've opened up the Pandora's box. They all want to know more about you. What is your website? Okay, so it's just www.gracefunsale.com. And Funsale is spelled V-A-N-Z-Y-L, but you pronounce it with an F-U-N, like fun. <laughs> I don't know if I'm much fun, but <laughs> Grace Von Zell, such a beautiful podcast. Now you see why peace is possible because of the Grace Von Zell in Southern Africa and all of you who are watching us today. It's up to you to bring the peace that our world needs. You are the peace other people need. And if you listen carefully to Grace today, you heard peace begins with me. And if I'm at peace, I can listen and I can pay attention and I can bring the peace that this world needs. And so with that, I thank you, Grace, again. Thank you. And I thank you for having me. What an honor. And I thank you for watching today. Peace is possible, and you learn from each of these podcasts. As you know, our Peace Community Magazine is about to come again, and all you have to do is go to peacepodcast.org, and you will be able to see the latest issue. With that, I say thank you. Thank you for giving us this 20 minutes of your precious life, and may peace prevail on earth. I'm Barbara Gahn-Mueller saying thank you. Thank you.